The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. OK. Uh, in this module, we're going to talk about quality. And uh, uh, let me just say that, that, you know, the whole lean process doesn't work without quality. And everybody thinks of quality, you think of manufacturing, OK? Uh, let me suggest to you that as we extended manufacturing to our suppliers, if the supplier ships incomplete, incorrect parts to us, uh, uh, doesn't do us any good. I had F-15 composite assemblies coming in from Israel, and they were stacking up. And when I, when I got there, uh, it was before my time. I didn't start that line. And they were shipping and getting paid for these composite sections on the F-15. And my guys were rejecting them because of voids or you know discrepancies. And then we were trying to figure out how, from an engineering standpoint, to uh, disposition those from a standpoint, do we have to cut out the, cut out the nom Nomex and put a patch on it and that kind of stuff? And I said, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is wrong. You know, We want Israeli aircraft industries to make a perfect part, to inspect it, to get our acceptance on that part and ship a good part so I can put it right on top, you know, right in the, in the assembly line. And so there's no way that you can achieve cycle time, can achieve man hours and personnel hours. I'm gender center. See, I'm an old guy. And, and, and when I started in this business, it was man hours. Now it's labor hours. And uh, so uh, you can't achieve your unit cost uh, or your schedule with bad quality. And most people think of this kind of an example in terms of manufacturing and that kind of stuff. Now, and I've just given you a manufacturing example in the factory and a supplier giving us bad parts. But in engineering, if we have incorrect drawings or we have mistakes on the drawing where the tolerances are wrong or we leave out a material call out or call out the wrong material spec or something like that, we send those drawings or the equivalent 3D solid um, technical data out to the suppliers. They get it wrong. It comes in wrong or our factory builds it wrong. So of, the, of all the elements of achieving a lean enterprise, quality is, is you know, critical. And it's quality in accounting data, quality in everything, OK? So I mean, I'll say this about 10 times. And if you, if you give me a, a low mark for saying he's repetitive, I'll take that. Because it's for emphasis, OK? Very, very important. So we're going to talk about how quality is essential to achieving customer satisfaction. I don't want two cardboard boxes in the back of my brand new car that says take it to the dealer, you know, because we, they delivered a car without 100% of the components in it, and that happens. We're going to talk about product quality and process quality, and the fact is it's very, very difficult to get product quality without good processes. We're going to talk about the, some tools, and these are tools that you may not have been exposed to before. And we're going to talk about, you remember in the beginning, Earl mentioned the fact that we've got Lean, and then we've got Six Sigma, and industry basically now is talking about Lean Six Sigma. And uh, we're trying to achieve the customer satisfaction. You know, there, are, there are people that are consultants now that are making their livelihood about saying, Use our process, and we're going to get an overjoyed customer. You know that that kind of stuff. You know, deliriously happy customer. Well, that's what we want too. I heard someone mention, and maybe it was Mark or somebody before, talking about the iceberg effect. This is a typical, typical um, uh, drawing now, because this is classically. You know, the Titanic didn't see this to the end. The problem what sunk the sunk the ship was this big hunk of the iceberg that was below the water. And uh, the stuff that we can measure uh, very readily is scrap and rework, service calls, warranties. Scrap and rework, I mean, typically you can have 10% scrap and 
15% rework in the old days, that's 25% of the product cost. The reason that Detroit can't compete with, you know, Honda and Nissan and, and, and uh, uh, Toyota is the fact is that we've got very high rates of this in the U.S. And so they can get a 25% cost advantage just by getting perfect quality. You remember yesterday I said Lexus is, next time you see the, the Lexus logo or on the advertising uh, on, the, on TV and all that, Lexus, the relentless pursuit of perfection, that means getting rid of this stuff. And that's a, roughly a 20-25% cost advantage and it helps us deliver a competitive product to our customers. Service calls, you know, that, that's the, may, you know, the all before your time, but in early days of television, there used to be an ad of a guy who just died recently, the Maytag repairman. And he used to sit there, and he was sitting there drinking, drinking coffee and uh, ha having a cigarette. And Maytag used to say their quality was so good that our repairman had nothing to do. Nobody ever called them because our washing machines and our dishwashers, Maytag is the quality. I mean, that's a, used to be a standard joke. But it turns out that that's what, we, that, a service call uh, while on a brand new product, you know, uh, is, is waste. And it makes unhappy customers because they're calling you because they have a problem. Typically, if it's under warranty, guess who pays for it? You know, we have to pay. You know, we have to send somebody out to Fort Rucker to fix an Apache. It's on us. You know, that kind of stuff. So that's not great. And then concessions. I mean, this is... Boeing is going to wind up paying concessions to the airlines for being delivering late. Airbus is paying millions, hundreds of millions, because the Airbus A380 is late. So we don't, you know, and that's all poor quality. And then you've got excess inventory. I mean, we, we had a great example of that yesterday. You remember at the end of the round, if you had it, you know, it comes off your bottom line. Over time, boy, oh boy, I bet you they're spending millions in Seattle making sure the 787 is delivered as fast as they can. And those guys are working seven day weeks, seven day weeks. Absolutely, non-value added steps. We talked about that, cues and delays. I told you that classically, everybody has tattooed on their arm. The biggest waste are move and cue, moving stuff between machines and all that. If you don't have to, you remember the, the, in, the, in the athletic shoe department, the ladies were just moving that stuff between each other, you know, on the, on the production line there. One of the issues that came with the Industrial Revolution that I showed you on my very first chart um, a couple of days ago was the fact is that, that we went from the craft, the master jeweler, making the, that he knew exactly how to build that watch, to the mass production system, Henry Ford and is the best example of it, but other people did that, where in fact we built something and then inspected it. The problem with that is the fact is that it's difficult Inspection is subject to errors. How well trained is the inspector? How good is his in inspection equipment? Um, his measurement capability? And then, um, you know, is it, you know, is it a Monday morning and he had a tough weekend uh, after a Super Bowl party? You know, that kind of stuff. Here, uh, in your packet, there's a thing called F exercise. Everybody got it? Okay, great, thanks. All right, what we're gonna do what we're going to do, let me just see if I can get, we're going to time this exercise. We're big on stopwatches around here, okay? And what I want you to do is to circle all the F's, look up here, the F's or the capital F's, okay, on the page. We're going to give you 30 seconds, and what we want you to do is to circle, circle all those F's, and then count them, okay? And tell me how many, how many that you found, okay? And uh, when I say go, uh, ready, set, go. Stop. Stop. Okay. All right. Um, 13 to 17 Fs. Nobody was 13 or 17. Again, this is not a test. <laughs> Low numbers are part of the data collection process. 18 to 22. 18 to 22. The one, two, three, four, four. Um, Put a bar, right there. There we go. Um, uh oh, do a bar, please. A bar. Yeah. Leslie? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, 23 to 27. Whoa, lots of those. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 
9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15. On my count's 15. 15. Okay, that's off the chart. It's up here somewhere. Okay, 15 folks in that box. Alrighty, um, 28 to 32. 28 to 32. One, two, three. All right, it looks like we found our, uh, looks like we found our peak here. See, that first one was four, so this one's three. This is the lower, higher. Um, there we go. And anybody get more than 33 or more? 33 or more. Nobody got 33 or more. Yes. Sorry, I just went to get a calculator. You guys made my job easy. Well, let me show you. There they are. Do you know how many Fs there are? 36. 36. Now, the issue is, the issue is that, I mean, I was going to calculate what percent of the class got the answer right or what percent of the class got that. We now have 100% of the class that got it wrong. And the point is that all of, you know, all of this, this area is, I mean, the, the ones that we've missed are what we call in the business escapements, escapements. And it's a quality escapement. What does that mean? The, whatever process that we put in place uh, didn't catch the defect, didn't catch the defect. I was at Mesa last week, I told you on this Rudan exercise, and we're looking for voids using ultrasonic thermography and x-rays to catch voids in the Apache Attack Helicopter Block 3 improved aerodynamic rotoblade. And the point is that we want a foolproof system to catch the errors. Why? Because in fact it won't, you know, it'll fatigue and you know, we'll, we'll kill a couple of pilot, a pilot and a co-pilot gunner. Can't do that. So we have to be good. Now the issue is that inspection, inspection is costly, and inspection is costly and in fact the, the, what has come out of the, the, the systems and all of our knowledge and experience now is that you cannot inspect, listen to this now, you cannot inspect quality into the product. You can inspect it because even as we improve our inspection techniques, you're going to miss something. And so all the things that we're trying to do in Lean are to in fact foolproof, Murphy proof the system so that the tools, the design, uh, and the individual operator's proficiency, you remember I keep on saying that the, the expert in the system is the person, the guy or the gal that does the job every day. They know what's wrong and they can stop it and they have to stop it. If, that, if the workforce is not motivated and not trained, it's, it's very, very difficult. But we try upstream, you know, the smart engineers, the smart quality engineers that design the process system is to in fact make it so that we can't make a mistake. Earl showed you a chart the other day, the one that had the elephant on it, and then right after that we, we showed the ones where the, the pieces cannot be installed incorrectly. And we use all sorts of techniques like, you know, uh, an electrical, you know, a yellow wire with a yellow plug and we put it on like that, or we, we use a, a great big fat lug and a big fat wire to fit on that lug and it won't, it won't fit on the other ones. We try to take all opportunities, opportunities for errors out of the system. So, anyway, we'll talk more about that. Terrific. Okay, now, here's an interesting thing. Inspection and quality typically are 10% of the cost. I mean, we try to get it down to 10% of the cost and try to do better than that. So, quality is an expensive part of it. You remember I said scrap and we were going to be 25%. We're trying to get that down to zero. We're trying to get our quality perfect and it turns out that inspector efficiency if you look this way you know I, I was going to calculate your efficiency and say well uh, we, we, we well actually okay. if, if you do it yeah. by by f it's about 70% yeah it's probably about 70% yes yeah which is this red one so it turns out that it turns out that <laughs> the name of the you know some people say well the quality is bad, add more inspectors. Add more inspectors, you know? Wrong, okay? I mean, yeah, you can in fact add multiple inspections or multiple inspectors to the, to the if point. We, if we could get Six Sigma with 11 of these people in a row. Yeah, but that <laughs> is not 10% quality. You see, the problem is that you can't, 
you can't be competitive with very high amount. These are the escapements, in, and this is a new term maybe for you, defects per million. Uh, that is a technique for, you know, that is, is used as, a, as a, a, a parameter. But the point is, as you try to strive for perfection, you're adding more and more quality personnel, and it's the wrong way to go. We don't want to do that. We want to be able to make our inspection processes. And so this issue I was talking about yesterday, or uh, just before, we were using a artificial intelligence system, artificial intelligence system, which in a new technique called thermography, which was in fact scanning, scanning the rotor blades for voids and defects by using a bright strobe light that in fact created a slight amount of heat on the surface of the part so that if there was a void, there would be a, a delta T f where the void was compared to the, the basic rotor blade and that it took a, 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 a infrared picture of that and we could detect the voids and we were developing software to be able to read that and say that void does not meet our spec, it's greater than a quarter inch or something like that and uh, whatever the, we're going to talk about upper and lower control limits for those kinds of things. But we would like to be able to automate it because we can't depend on people, pure inspection to do that. So this is, this is tough stuff, tough stuff when we're making very complex products that you folks are going to be working on, whether it's, you know, computers or automobiles or airplanes or rockets or spacecraft. I mean, this stuff is tough. We talk about, NASA talks about man-rated. That means you know, somebody's life is at stake. And um, so we have to be good. Okay, so conformance to the, to the spec and to our tolerance band for acceptable quality. Now, when I say acceptable quality, I can tell you about, a, you know, we talk about machine parts plus or minus 15 thousandths. That's a, a normal kind of a, a tolerance band. And, uh, and we're going to talk about process capability here pretty soon. And, uh, but sometimes the processes are, are very, very smaller than that. I used to make 60 M242 guns a month for the, for the Bradley fighting vehicle, for the uh, M242 chain gun. The chain gun fired 600 rounds a minute, 10 a second. Those moving parts were zooming in on there. The, 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 the spec on those parts, the tolerance on that, was two ten thousandths of an inch, two ten thousandths of an inch, and my friends at Pratt and Whitney, I mean, they can relate to twenty thousand RPM uh, uh, rotors and compressors and stuff like that. And the tolerances are very, very small when you're talking about that. Much, and they, and while we're on that subject, you just not, you cannot just take any old machine and get that kind of capability. And so we're going to have to match the machine to the process requirements we have because you just can't put it at vendor A or vendor B because they may not have a machine that can do that. Or we may not have a machine. We have to go find somebody who can do that stuff. So engineers have got to be sensitive to this. So we're talking about upper and lower control limits or upper and lower specification limits. So when I said plus or minus upper spec limit, lower spec limit, plus or minus 15 thousandths, that would be what we're trying to control to. And we're going to talk about control charts. Process quality is a measure of the capability to be able to produce it. When we want very, very precise holes, we use a, a machine called a jig boring machine. And they're made in Switzerland quite often. And they make the best machines and you can, you can drill very, very precise holes. You just can't take, you know, the Sears Roebuck uh, drill press and get that kind of uh, dimensional quality. Okay, so how can we assure process quality? And we're going to talk about some of that. So there's a series of tools. There's a series of tools that we use in the quality business. Flow charts, you've seen that. Now what basically do is take a flow chart and say, what are all the processes to build our part? And we used to kid around at the, you know, when we talk about a flow chart, mill, drill, tap, and scrap. Now how's that? Mill it, drill it, tap it, and then, gee, we didn't make the, we didn't make the, the spec, so we scrap it you know, mill, drill, tap, and scrap. But a flow chart is exactly what we did the other day uh, when we were talking about, you know, uh, building airplanes. But we do that because of the fact that the quality engineers, and incidentally, that's another whole brand of quality, uh, type of engineers that we have aero engineers and chem engineers and civil engineers, but there's a thing called quality engineers. And these folks are real engineers. 
that in fact help us work on these. Uh, uh, and so we lay out the sequence, the manufacturing engineers lay out the sequence of all of the, the flow chart on how we're going to mill it, drill it, heat uh, rough machine, stress relieve, finish machine, you know, grind, those kinds of things. And then we have check sheets. And in each operation, if it's a heat treating operation, we have a check sheet that says, make sure that the oven is up to 350 degrees, make sure that the tool is in the proper place. So we have a check sheet to make sure that the employees follow the process. This is a histogram, a histogram of the data. Lean is a data-driven exercise. And we always collect data. No more opinions, get me the data kind of thing. Okay, so that's a tool. A Pareto chart, it looks like a histogram, except that a Pareto chart basically plots the biggest and then the next biggest and then all the way down to the bottom. Because we want to be able, in our business, find the kinds of errors and work on the biggest ones first because we don't have unlimited resources. Okay, so we won't spend a lot of time on that. So here's a fun exercise. These are your dessert for lunch, okay? Open up the bag, and please don't eat them. Yeah, get, get, there's a, a sheet that looks like this. It says blank, a blank Pareto chart. Blank Pareto chart. Now, uh, if everybody's, everybody's got their Pareto chart blank, um, uh, what I want you to do now, don't, I want you to open them and put them right in front of you, and I want you to count them, okay? Count the, the total number of, e each of you count them, and up in the corner, up in the corner of your chart, up in the top corner of the chart, just tell me how many you've counted. You can eat the half. Don't, don't count the broken ones. You can, eat, you can eat the broken one. And don't break anymore. <laughs> the next step, if you, the first thing was to count the total. The second step I want you to do is, is to sort the colors. How many reds, how many oranges, how many browns, how many greens, etc. Well, no, it says right here. Yeah. Okay, how are we doing on numbers? Absolute number. Okay. Does everybody get the numbers done? Okay. So we're going to start right here. How many numbers did you have? Okay, let's, 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 okay. let's just uh, let's just do it on mass. How many you got? Fifty-five. Fifty-five. Who else got fifty-five? One, two, three, four, five, fifty-fives. Fifty-six. Two, three, fifty-sixes. Fifty-seven. There's a fifty-four. Two, two, fifty-seven. Yeah, okay, we'll, we'll go the other way. Oh, okay. 257, we're just kind of letting this run out. 58, <laughs> the 158. Okay, uh, looks like we're biased in the other direction. 54, wow. one, two, three. Oh, it's a spread. Wait, it's not 54. One more. 50, one, there was one more. Two more. Five fifty four is 53. Wow. One, fifty two. One, two, 53. <laughs> okay, and that's it. 60, whoa. Oh. Never yeah, seen a 60. Any, never any, seen a 60. Any, any yeah. other high lows? 30 times doing this, never seen a 60. Yeah, this is, this is interesting. It's the highest spread ever. Yeah. I think M&M's uh, process control is something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. This is the biggest spread we've ever seen by quite a bit. So you, you learn things from this. That's, okay, so we're 53, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 60. And our biggest number is 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Uh, one of the lessons here is that this doesn't have to be complicated, right? This is very simple data. But uh, uh, 50, that's 53, 54, there's 5 of those. 55, there's 5. Now, this is a, this is a histogram histogram and it's a way of displaying data, way of displaying data. Now we're going to relate that to the factory and to the engineering um, and to our, to our quality process but we want you to be able to recognize that we, we send you out to, the, to, to solve problems and we want efficient ways of, of plotting the data and um, so this is a very very interesting and this shows a couple of things. One, that there's a wide wide variability, wide variability in, in the, the count. Now, um, how, just a, here's a question. Is everybody done sorting their, everybody done sorting? I think most of the folks are done 
count, I mean, count how many reds and, okay, but, all right, now it turns out, looking at this data, do you think that M&M &M controls their process by the count? What do you think they control it by? Weight, Wait, right, good. Now, if you take a look on your bag, take a look on the bag on the front of it. Ha, ah, you've already eaten it up, right? Okay. okay, you see the net weight is 1.69, 1.69 ounces. Now, to two decimal places, or three significant places there, that's how they control the weight. Because the Food and Drug Administration and the weights and measures of the whatever state, you know, say that you cannot fraudulently, uh, you know, uh, deceive the customer. So that's the, the upper and lower control limits in their process typically is, um, you know, is going to be on weight because they, they, can't, they can't deceive the customer for whatever they charge for M&Ms these days. In fact, on this, on this chart you can see something else interesting. Is this symmetrical? No. 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 And where's the, where's the steep edge? The low end. No. The low end. Because, because they'll get in trouble if they underweight people, right? And they're probably a real strict legal spec on, on how often you can screw up here. Well, as this, that's just M&M's, right? They, they don't want to give you too many extra, but you get a couple of, if you get 60 every now and then, that's fine with them. I'll do some colors now. So, uh, let's, how many, how many folks, uh, well, let's talk about everybody, how, how many red ones did you get? One. One? 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 Yeah, one. One. Only one? One. 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 Really? Yeah, see? That's a good. How about blues? How many blues? Six. What's the difference between blue and aqua? Oh. Oh, okay. Uh, other so is there a, no, you got blue, right? Yeah, you got blue. Yeah, yeah, like blue. Yeah. Ignore <laughs> those. Okay. Okay. How many? How many blues did you get? Four. Four. Eighteen. Four. Eleven. Eighteen. Eight. Yeah, that's it. See, they don't control by color. They they mix them up variable. But I mean, if anybody has little kids and the folks in the back have all been through that, little kids fight over. I want a red one. I want a yellow one. So they they try to mix them up. But we control the delivery. How about yellows? One. Nine. Six. Nine and one? Four, seven, ten. <laughs> wow. Browns? Seven. Uh, eleven. Eight. Twelve. Five. Nine. Well, it's interesting because little kids typically don't like that color. You know? <laughs> green. How about green? Fifteen. Seventeen. Fourteen. Seven. Eleven. Wow, look at that. See? Okay, so you get the you get the picture. We're not they, they try to randomly control them, but in fact they don't do it. But the, the point of the story is, and many of you Many of them, some of the folks over here and like here, actually have them stacked in Pareto water, and they actually have the M&Ms stacked just like this, and that's a Pareto chart. Now, let me just grab a blank piece of paper. The point, the point of the tour, and Earl and Hugh have heard me say this, there's probably no more important tool, no more important tool in the whole business of quality uh, than, than the Pareto chart. Why? Because the Pareto chart's easy to do. I mean, you know, you can do it just with the M&Ms like you can see here. But the point is, quality is a data-driven exercise. And we have a problem, a problem out in the factory delivering Honeywell, Honeywell um, uh, computers for the flight control system of a MD-11, using that as an example. And the point is, we go out there and we, in fact, analyze them. You know, we try to find out what's going on. And we take a whole bunch of the computers and try to find out what the root cause of the problem is. And so we wind up, you know, with a Pareto chart. And we said part of them, in fact, is the, the, is the power supplies. And, you know, this number of these guys had defective grounds. And these number, you know, basically had a tolerance problem, you know, on the output. You know, that kind of thing. So... What we do is that, you know, with that kind of data, we go back to the engineers and say, holy cow, you know, what's going on in the power supply? And he said, you know, we just changed suppliers. We just went from, you know, General Electric to Westinghouse on that. In fact, this is a real case on Westinghouse. Westinghouse offloaded to uh, an outfit in Puerto Rico, and, you know, we were getting terrible, terrible quality. Okay, that's one kind of a thing. Let's talk about, let's talk about, Late deliveries. Why are we getting late deliveries of an actuator? Okay, we failed test. 
we had a supply problem, didn't get all the parts. We wound up with a situation where we had an engineering error in the, okay, that wasn't caught. Uh, it was actually an engineering change, okay? So, you know, we, what's wrong with the test? Earl yesterday, and, and do you remember the drill about the five whys? The five whys, you know, why is the test wrong? Is it that, so we drive it down to the next area, you know, and is it, is it calibration? You know, is it a bad setup? So you just keep on drilling down. Now, the other issue from a lean standpoint, if you go out and work in a lean environment, and <laughs> Ida can tell you, you know, they don't give you unlimited lean budget. You got a lean staff, and the point is, where are we gonna spend our money to solve the biggest problems first, and where are our biggest problems? And if we can make, you know, with a red line here, if we can make, you know, a 25% improvement in our biggest item, it's better than, you know, eliminating a whole problem over here. And we only, which ones do we attack first? Which budget item? We're over, we're over budget. We're over budget. Why? Well, where are we spending our money? Where are we spending our money? We're spending our money in uh, utilities. We're spending our money in, you know, capital. We're spending our money in, you know, overhead kind of stuff. Well, you know, we go through a big drill. What, what part of this is, what part of that utility budget is electricity? Turns out to be very, very high, very, very high. And so you go and put in, and I wound up putting in a whole big plant of um, uh, a uh, thermal generating plant to, to reduce our electricity cost. So uh, the, another, another great tool is called the, the cause and effect diagram. This is, the, the Japanese name for this is the Ishikawa diagram because Dr. Ishikawa came up with this. And in the old days, in the old days, this was called the 5 M. It was measurement, material, methods, machine, and manpower. Now we call it personnel, okay? And we've added the environment to it. And you can, you can say, we're trying to understand, we're trying to understand, you know, this Honeywell uh, computer problem. And we have this issue in terms of the testing. You know, that, so now we say, what's wrong? So we look at measurement, and, and this is a brainstorming technique. You get all the engineers, the manufacturing guys, the tooling guys there, and you say, you know, is it a test calibration issue? Is it uh, the precision we can't measure it close enough? Is it the fact that we're not getting repeatability? You know, in a material thing, we're getting bad tolerances on that piston that we're, we're for the compressor, uh, you know, a standard old-fashioned compressor. You know, is it a M&P, material process issue? Is it a geometry problem? Is there inclusions in the titanium forging which causes defects in it and so forth? So you basically brainstorm the things that could be driving the issue and then you send a little team out to get, get some measurements and then have a meeting next week and say, what'd you find about the calibration? The guy says, okay, so that may not be the issue. So th this is a great way of displaying the results of brainstorming and giving your, uh, the quality engineers and engineers uh, a tremendous way of organizing your, your uh, search efforts to get rid of the, the errors and get high quality. So we're talking about inputs. You know, Earl talked to you about a process the other day. And one of the things that we want to do is to be able to get a repeatable process. So I mentioned machine part plus or minus 15 thousandths and we measure the parts that are coming out of the process and uh, we want to ensure that a high percentage of our output <laughs> would like to have a hundred percent of the output in fact meet our tolerances so what we're trying to do is basically if we have if we have non-quality we want to identify the opportunities. We want to define them. We define them with histograms and so forth, and then we Pareto them. And then we want to identify the root cause, and we want to take corrective action. And then we want to see if we can get, if the corrective action brings our measured output, the measured output within the upper and lower control limits of a control chart. And we're going to 
move into that. So there's a couple of terms that are used, common cause and special cause. Common cause is basically variability that you saw in rolling the dice uh, and so forth, and that happens uh, in, in, um, uh, in uh, measurement of uh, machine parts or in electricity and so forth. But special causes are the fact is that there's something wrong. We haven't trained the people right. We have a machine that's not operating. We have defects in the material. The method has been changed and the, the folks didn't catch that. And the, and the occurrence of a special or what we call a assignable cause typically drives an out-of-control condition. And, and so we have to go look for that and we use a control chart to do that. So control charting is the primary tool of statistical process control and you I showed your chart the other day and you'll probably see it again here that the fact is that what we we want engineering to design in a robust method so that our suppliers and our in-house fabrication can put their parts into statistical process control so that we get repeatable high quality repeatable high quality and so what we want to do is, so we're going to talk about SPC charts, statistical process control charts, time sequence charts that are important.